All right, so in our last video, uh, we looked at how we can build up abstractions from the most basic, which is just a transistor, a basic switch, uh, to create logic gates and use those logic gates to, gates, excuse me, to create an ALU. Uh, now we're going to look at how we can use those same uh, transistors through different uh, logic gates and other abstractions to store information. Uh, it is not as simple as saying I have a transistor and a transistor has you know a zero or one output and therefore all I need is a transistor to store a bit. It might be intuitive to think of it this way but it is actually incorrect at least insofar as how a uh, computer uh, normally functions. Now there is differences with secondary storage and, and flash storage and stuff like that but I'm going to get into the specifics of that later. Uh, what I'm really going to be focusing on here is SD style um, or SRAM style, excuse me, storage. So remember we talked earlier about SRAM and DRAM and we said SRAM or static RAM is faster and it's made in silicon out of transistors um, as opposed to DRAM, which is actually usually made of capacitors with a transistor to turn on and off. Um, and is, is slower but has more capacity and that's usually what our actual RAM is made out of where SRAM is usually our registers which is what we care the most about right now um, but also our cache which we're going to talk a lot about later. Um, so why can't we just use a single transistor to store? Well the answer is is that you know if you think about what the, the transistor is doing it's actually performing an operation right you you apply voltage to it you have a control wire that you can turn on or off, and based upon the state of that control wire, uh, the transistor either outputs a zero or a one. You're actually applying the answer to the control wire, right? We usually use this to perform logic or to, you know, figure out something based upon um, logic within our code. Um, but storing something that's that's a little unintuitive, right? Um, in fact, I can actually kind of express it uh, this way. If you think about like, you know, what would be fundamentally the easiest way you could store a one or a zero? Well, if you have a single transistor, you're just applying the answer to the control. So to apply it there would imply that you already had it, right? So how would I store something? Well, what if we fed it back, right? What if we had a transistor that just fed back on itself? Well, that would be an infinite loop, but let's, let's do it with something that we can control, like an AND or an OR gate. So with an AND gate, you know, you have two inputs, and if we had one that was actually fed back from its own output, uh, there'd be no way we could ever store one in this AND gate, right? Because the output of the AND gate would always be a zero because one of its control lines is always going to be a zero because it never obtains being a one because it needs both to be a one in order to, to actually output a one and keep it going. An OR gate is the actual uh, opposite problem. Um, you can actually have an OR gate either way, but once you put a 1 on the A, you can never get the 1 out, right? So if I start with this and I have A and B and both are 0, my output is 0 and 0 double backs to B, and no problem, right? Um, but if I, the moment I change an A or the A input here to be a 1, then the OR gate outputs a 1, and if we imagine that every single cycle, so this loop here is meant to imply that every single cycle of our clock, whatever is output from this AND gate is then brought back to the input here. So every cycle we look at these two inputs, and then on the next cycle the output is considered here. So in this case, I put my 1 on here. Uh, it's an OR, so it would be 1 or 0 at this point. It would output a 1. And then on the very next cycle, B would be a 1. So regardless of what I put on A, B will always be a 1 from now on because the OR only needs one of these two to be a 1. It outputs a 1, and this will infinitely be a 1. So you can actually store a 1 with an OR gate because this is actually stored now. This will continue to loop around, so every clock cycle it'll come back and be re-input into the gate. Um, but I can never undo it. Right? It's set there forever. Just like an AND can actually never be anything other than a zero in this same example. So what could we do to actually store data? Well, to store it in a way where it loops back on itself, just like we're seeing here. So every clock cycle we need to provide the data that we stored as an input in such a way that it will continually stay in this loop but we want to be able to change it, unlike here where we can, right? It's either a zero or a one. Um, but here we want to be able to change it. So 
what we have here is a basic latch. So you have two inputs, uh, an input and a reset. So if you, what's on the input is the actual data you want to store. So let's say that we want to store, in this case, a zero. Um, so you have a zero on that first line going to the, the first OR gate there. Um, and you have a reset here to, to clear it. So this actually means that um, you know it'll retain whatever it has until you reset it. So I think I have some slides here that kind of play this out. So let's do it this way. So we have an input of a zero, a reset of a one. Um, and what that will do is it will actually clear it. So the way that happens is because I provide this NOT gate with a one, the output of the NOT gate, of the not gate is a zero. Uh, this AND gets a zero, so it's always going to be a zero, regardless of what was here, which, by the way, is the latch. This is where the data will get stored, uh, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, but this output's a zero, which means that this is a zero. So no matter what was here before, what we've effectively done is switch this AND gate off and allowed it to output. The reason this is a NOT is because when we let go of the reset, which you're about to see here, when we turn this back to a zero, this not always outputs a one, which means that if there's a one on this one, this AND gate lets it pass. And if it's not and it's a zero, then the AND gate outputs a zero, right? Um, but either way, this loop here gets retained. So after resetting, if we input a zero, we still get a zero, right? Because this line of the AND gate uh, was fed into a zero. Um, but if we do give it a 1, let's see what happens here. We put a 1 on the input line here. Uh, the OR now, of course, because we have 0 or 1, uh, outputs a 1. The 1 comes in here. This NOT is always inputting a 1 until we reset it. So the 1 goes into the AND gate, loops back, hits the OR. Doesn't matter what we have here now, right? Because the OR is going to take this 1. So if this flips back to a 0, this OR still outputs the 1. It comes to the end, and it just keeps looping around, right? So congratulations. We have stored a bit. We can store a 0. We can store a 1. And we can clear it. In order to clear it, which we would need to do, by the way, to set it back to a 0. Because note here, if I set this to a 0, it won't change anything. Because I have this 1 looping back in this OR, and this OR will just take either one, right? It doesn't matter. Um, so to reset it, I need to flip the reset bit. So I flip the reset bit like we did before here to a one. That flips this not gate, hits this zero to the and. The and now outputs a zero, and we're clear. So then you are free to, to save something new in it, right? So that's a basic latch. Now, this isn't an ideal setup, um, and this isn't how most uh, RAM would store something. And the reason why this isn't ideal is because we actually have to control this reset line uh, for each one of these bits. So this isn't um, an ideal way to do it. The way that we normally would do this is actually more complex, and it's called a gated latch. Now, the reason why we do it this way is because we get this write enable line, um, which is different than a reset. So remember with the reset, we had to kind of know, like, when are we going to reset it? It was, it was an asynchronous action. We had this idea of setting the bit right here where we set it to a zero or a one. Um, but when we wanted to reset it, we first had to reset it and then pick a new zero or one to, to put in there. It was kind of two actions. Here, we can in one action enable all of our lines, which by the way, we can do for all of the memory we want to affect at once. So all of the like individual gated latches that, by the way, this whole thing just holds one bit. So, um, you know, what do we got? Two transistors here, two here, uh, one here, so up to five, two more is seven, uh, eight, and two more is 10. So we're up to what, 10 transistors here to store one bit. So it is not one transistor uh, per bit stored. It's actually 10 in this design. But every single one of the places we store a bit, each one of these gated latches can be tied together for this right enable. So if you imagine, let's, let's consider a uh, register because that's the kind of most basic unit of storage. And that's how registers are designed usually is using a gated latch. When you say, say, have an 8-bit register, you would have eight of these gated latches, and all of their write-enable lines would be tied together. So when you write-enable uh, the register, then all of the data inputs uh, accept their input at the same time for each of the eight bits, right? 
So the way this works is basically, if this write enable is on, then whatever data is on this line will be accepted and it'll end up getting stored in this loop, which is what you see here. When this write enable is off, then it configures it in such a way where it doesn't matter what you have on this data input line, it's not going to make it in there. The other reason we use this, by the way, is because um, it's easy to think of uh, bus lines between components on a CPU, uh, especially we're gonna be talking about that in specific now, as like everyone has their own roads, so to speak, uh, as far as the bus lines go. So, you know, if you have, say you have two registers, um, or let's say you have four registers, it's easy to think about it as like you have four registers and they all have a path from one to the other, right? Like in a box or something like that. And then also have a cross in the middle so that any one register has a direct path to the others that only they share, but that's not the case. Um, usually what you do is you actually have one kind of bus that uh, goes around and stops at each of the places. Um, so whatever data is on the bus lines is seen by all of the components. So in that scenario, all four registers would see the same data on the same bus line. Now you only want to store it on one of them, right? So the data bus contains the information. All four registers are capable of storing it but only the one that is sent the write enable signal will be the one that actually does store it, right? The other three will remain in the state they were in because their write enable was low and their storage is unaffected, right? Even though all four registers in this example have the same data inputs and see the same information. So that is why a gated latch is used as opposed to say, you know, just a more basic latch like this one. So registers themselves, now that we know how to build them, let's talk a little bit more about what they are. Um, we obviously use the, the register uh, that we had in Little Man Computer, it was our only one. It was part of uh, the accumulator, um, it was, we referred to it. Um, but basically a register is just a small permanent location within the CPU that we can use to store information. Um, we can manipulate this information by basically turning on its write enable line uh, from the control unit and then taking whatever information is on that data bus and storing it within it. Um, registers can be wired for specific functions. So um, when we think of registers, we tend to think of them usually as what we call a general purpose register. This is a register that say, if I wanna to add two numbers, I can store um, say one of those numbers in or the result or something like that. But there are other kinds of registers that are known as um, general purpose versus uh, specialty purpose registers. So um, a general purpose register is one that we can control. A special purpose register is one that we cannot, we being the programmers, cannot control. So examples of this that we've talked about are things like the program counter. Um, you might think, well, wait, I can control that. Um, and, and in a sense you can, because you can, in your operand of a branch instruction, change the program counter. Um, but you're technically only changing it to point to another location in memory. Um, other than that, its operations are all uh, going to happen the way that they, they happen um, in a vacuum without you touching it, right? Um, and technically, even though your code's operand is changing the program counter, um, you can't just use it to, to put any value in there for any reason. It's only because the flow of your program changed that uh, it's, it is opting, meaning your program's logic is opting to have the control unit change the value of the program counter. Um, it's also important to note that later when we get into pipelining and things, we're sometimes going to refer to the program counter as an instruction pointer. Um, I'll discuss the reasons for that later. I just want you to know for now that a program counter and an instruction pointer are really the same thing. Uh, the instruction register, we've talked about that as well. Remember that's that register that uh, we take the instruction and then we put it in and break it up into the opcode and the operand. Um, this is also an example of a special purpose register. Um, the logic of the control unit knows that uh, for every fetch, it checks the program counter, goes to the location in memory that uh, is specified by the program counter, grabs that instruction and puts it into the instruction register. 
that's not the same as you changing the contents of the instruction register, uh, say when you move information into a register or do an addition or something like that. This is a place that is used by the hardware to retain the current instruction that you're working with at the moment. Other examples of special purpose registers are the memory address register and memory data register. We're going to talk more about those in a moment. Um, those registers allow us to uh, you know, keep track of the address in memory that we want to grab something from and then the data that we get out of memory uh, when we in fact get that thing. Uh, there's also status registers that give us the status of uh, the CPU, those flags that we were talking about. Um, you know, out of the ALU. Um, they also keep track of things like power failures. So for example, if you pull the power on the back of your computer, um, there's actually a flag in there that goes high to denote that there's a power failure. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I just pulled the power. How would it uh, be able to do that since it doesn't have power? Um, and assuming that we're not talking about a laptop or something that has a battery, uh, the answer is, is that even if you pull it, there's still some, uh, you know, a small amount of time that there's enough power in the capacitors and things inside the computer that it has a little bit of time and we were talking much less than a second but it has a little bit of time in which it might be able to do some critical operations to try to save it from damage. Uh, one example of that is like when we had the old spinning hard drives, those are pretty uncommon nowadays, but they're still out there, especially in desktops. Uh, one thing that it, the computer would want to do is, is park the drive correctly so that um, it, the, the spinning, uh, the heads were not left over the spinning disc and, uh, you know, uh, presented a, a, a good possibility of crashing the hard drive if something were to go wrong or the computer were to get moved. So now we're going to talk about um, how memory actually operates. So this isn't uh, the registers. We're going to kind of step away from that. So just a, a quick kind of recap to, to separate the, the concepts we've been talking about. What we talked about here with the gated latch again was to build up the mechanism that we use for what we call SRAM, which if you remember from our hardware conversations is the fast, uh, usually small uh, memory that we have in our registers and our cache. And then we talked a little bit about what registers are and how we use them. But what we're going to be talking about here is how we actually communicate now between the CPU and actual RAM, RAM being the DRAM that we talked about, or the dynamic RAM. Um, this has a little bit of a different mechanism. Now, DRAM itself uh, is constructed differently from SRAM. DRAM is usually made up of capacitors, which are basically, you've used a capacitor uh, in your labs uh, when we did the lab with the, the servo. Um, a capacitor, remember, is a uh, almost like a battery of sorts. It doesn't hold a charge though if you remove current, remember. Um, it holds a kind of buffer so that uh, you know you can retain some power there. In the case of the servo, we used it as a way to you know add a little bit extra juice when the servo started moving uh, because the Arduino itself wasn't really capable of providing that much. So it was like this little buffer that when you weren't using it, it filled up and then as soon as you needed to use it, it could, it could be drained out to give you that little extra power when you need it. And then as soon as everything's back to normal, it'll fill back up, right? Well, we can use those same capacitors uh, just to store a little bit of uh, electricity and then check to see, you know, do they have any electricity in them, right? So is there current applied to this? And if there is, we can be a one. And if not, it could be a zero, right? So uh, we basically use those to create RAM. Now we're not going to go as deep into that and I'm not going to have slides and all that. Um, all I really want you to know there is that DRAM is constructed differently. Um, inherently it is made up of uh, capacitors, not um, silicon based, transistor based, um, you know, gates or gated latches like we talked about with uh, SRAM. But I do want to talk about how memory, the RAM, and the CPU communicate. So if you think about your program, 
running in instructions, right? That we've we've talked about how we we take a program and it, it's compiled into assembler, and then we assemble down to op operations, which are opcodes and operands, um, and we know that how that kind of flows through the CPU. Um, remember when we talked about the little man uh, going to look at the program counter, and let's say it starts at zero, he would then go in the fetch to uh, memory location zero, we said, and he would retrieve the value there, which he was going to put in his head, which we know is the instruction register, and that was going to be um, the operation that he was going to work on. Now, what we're focusing on is when he goes to memory for that or any other reason. So this also would include our reads and our writes to memory or our stores and our loads, right? The mechanism under which he actually communicates. I don't care so much about what makes up memory itself. Um, we're just going to talk about it abstractly and, and know that there are capacitors in there. Um, another thing that's helpful to know is that um, because capacitors only hold a charge for a short amount of time, they constantly have to be refreshed. So there's actually a refresh rate where all the capacitors are basically recharged if they are supposed to store a one. So there's a transistor basically there at the gate that says this capacitor is supposed to store something, so it allows the current through. And then on the refresh, that capacitor is refreshed. And then when you do a read, you look to see if there's a charge in the capacitor. It's effectively in, in a very high level how that works. Um, but again, this is focusing on how does the, the CPU communicate with memory? We need a couple of things. We need to be able to give memory the address that we want to access, right? So in our first example, where we were running through our program and our program counter was at zero, we wanted to access the data at memory location zero. So we need a place to store that. So the CPU actually has a register for this, a special purpose register that we, we mentioned um, last slide called the memory address register or MAR. Um, that location in memory that we want to access is going to be put there. So in our example, the program starting at memory location zero from the program counter, we're going to put in the MAR zero um, in order to access location zero in memory. Um, then memory is going to use another register called the memory data register in which to give us the results. So the memory address register and the memory data register are both registers in the CPU that are used to communicate with memory. They're used to hold the address and the data that we want to have. Uh, we can kind of look at this as a little bit of a visual um, a different way. So what we have over here is the memory address register. So you can imagine this being in the CPU, but it's, it's in the memory management unit, but that, that's not super important. And the memory data register here. Um, these are the two components that I'm talking about. Uh, there's also this decoder, which we haven't talked about, we're about to now. Um, and let's pretend that this is, for the sake argument right now, just a 4-bit uh, memory data register and memory address register. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about that for a second. What's our range on 4 bits, right? Our range on 4 bits is, is actually rather small, right? So... Uh, we know that our first place is, is 1 and 2 and then 4 and 8. So we have a range of 0 through 15 or 16. So that means we have 16 combinations of ways that we can handle 4 bits. Um, that means we can store a number in our memory data register um, of 0 to 15. And we can store in our memory address register 0 to 15. So 16 things here, 16 things here. That also means that we can only have, in this example of 4 bits, 16 actual data locations. Why? Because we can only address with 4 bits. So our memory address register is 4 bits. Let's imagine that we put in 4 zeros, right? We actually have 4 lines here, so ignore the dot dot dot. That would be if we had more than 4 bits here, so 0, 0, 0, 0 is what would be transferred from the memory address register when we want to access memory to this decoder. What the decoder does is it actually has one line out for each combination. So 
all zeros, all four zeros would result in this first line, which by the way here only shows three zeros, but just imagine it having a fourth, uh, would enable this line here. Whatever is on that line, these one, two, three, let's stop here, four bits, let's pretend these four don't exist because we're, for this early example, only talking about a four bit data bus. Um, then whatever is stored here, let's say this one has a zero, this one has a zero, this one has a one, and this one has a zero. So the number two, right? That information would then be transferred to the memory data register. So I'd have zero, zero, one, zero here. And that is how I would get out the information from the actual location in memory. So the data that's stored there would be put into the memory data register. And the way I knew to access this line is because of the combination of bits I had in the memory address register. So this decoder, uh, also sometimes referred to as a multiplexer, by the way, uh, basically takes in, in our case, the four lines in representing the four bits, and then it has a line out for each combination. In this case, this would have 16 lines out. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to 1, 1, 1, 1. And that would bring us to each individual place in memory where there would be this box here, which by the way represents, um, if this were like a cache or something like that, it would represent that gated latch. But in RAM, we know now that that actually represents a capacitor and, and a transistor that acts as a gatekeeper um, to actually store the information, right? So for each one of them, there'd be four of those capacitors in RAM. And if it happened to be SRAM for some reason, then each one of these would represent a gated latch. Um, so that's basically how this works. Um, now, obviously, usually you will have more than four bits in play, right? Because four bits only gives us 16 memory locations. Even our uh, little man computer, right, had 100 memory locations because remember it was in decimal and there was two digits uh, that we had for um, the, the memory address. Um, so therefore we could have up to 100 different locations. And the data was actually larger, right? The data was actually three decimal digits. So that meant that for little man computer, we'd have to have a uh, memory address register here capable of dealing with at least a hundred things, which since uh, in reality it would be in binary, it would have to actually be, you know, a, uh, I guess, seven bit computer um, or seven bit memory address. Uh, but our, our memory data register would actually have to be even larger than that, right? Because we'd have to support up to a thousand things, which we know is actually about 10 bits, right? 10 bits would give us 1,024. Uh, so this would have to be 10 bits. And this would have to be probably at least seven, but that, that's not super important. Of course, we know little man computer is just an abstraction, right? Um, one computer uh, platform that I work with a lot that's easy to understand uh, for these kind of reasons is the 6502. Uh, the 6502 is a, is a processor that was used in uh, early computers like the Apple IIe. It was used in the original Atari, if anyone has ever uh, seen one of those. Um, Commodore 64, or the PET. It was a it was a lot of computers, um, you know, especially back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, to kind of put this in perspective, those those processors were 8-bit machines, um, but they had a 16-bit data bus. So that meant that on a 6502 processor, this memory address register had to be 16 bits, and this memory data register was only eight. All of the other general purpose registers in the 6502 were eight as well, um, because once you got data out, you were working with data in eight bit sizes, right? So we know the range on eight bits is what, 256, right? So zero to 255 can be stored for a range of 256. So that means in each location in memory, I could store a number from zero to 255, um, but, that also means, like, if I had, remember I don't, it's a 16-bit address, but I want to point out why, if I only had 8 bits in which to address memory, that means that I could only store 256 things, right? Because I only have 8 bits here in order to represent that. So that's why uh, the 6502 had 16-bit 
memory address because 16-bit meant that I could store a whole lot more, right? It actually meant that I could store, I think it was 64K. Uh, so I could store 64,000 8-bit uh, locations in memory, right? So that's a, a kind of very high level explanation of, of how this comes together. But the important part is like, let's, let's kind of take a quick look at it here from the perspective of what we talked about in Little Man Computer. Um, we go to that program counter. Um, so let's let's use this example exactly how it is here. So we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six bits here, right? Um, so let's assume that this is in fact uh, what's in the program counter, right? So we have one zero 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 one one in the program counter, which in decimal is a is a forty. Well, I read it backwards. Sorry. So one one zero 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 one, uh, which in decimal is a forty nine, right? So uh, whatever was in the program counter gets loaded into the memory address register. Here's what it is. We put that into the decoder. Remember, there's one line for each possibility. So quite literally, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 49. So this would then turn on the, the one line that represents the 49. And whatever information is stored, in this case, we have 8 bits um, for our word size, which remember word size is the number of bits that are commonly worked with on a computer uh, platform. So uh, the 6502 that I mentioned before was an 8-bit word size because I said the memory data register and all the general purpose registers would have been 8 bits in size. Our data bus would have been 8 bits in size. Um, in that case, the address bus was larger, that was 16 bits, but that was only to address something. The actual data was always 8 bits in size. This one is 8 bits as well. Uh, modern computers would be normally 64 bits. Um, some older ones might be 32 or some like embedded ones that are smaller uh, could be 32 or less. Um, but the word size is basically what you're looking at here. It's the size of a single unit of data that you're going to save. Um, usually they're going to be at least 8 bits. Even the, the smallest, most um, rudimentary computers today have 8-bit word sizes. Um, but usually they're much larger. So, you know, a modern computer easily can go up to 64 bits there. All right, so uh, again, we, we get the, the data here that's put into the memory address register um, that's decoded by the address decoder. Uh, the one line is lit up. The data here that's stored at these places is then put into the memory data register. This, remember, is gated latches. Uh, this, if we're representing RAM, is uh, you know a combination, like we said, of capacitors and, and a transistor that basically act as a gatekeeper. Um, and remember here, any like any other register, this represents the data bus going into this register, which represents, let me kind of go back a little bit here, um, the data input. So each, uh, each bit stored in that register, and there's eight of them, would be represented by a gated latch. Uh, all those data inputs would be those eight lines coming down from memory. And then remember, there'd be a write enable that's tied together for all of them so that basically when we want to store something from memory into the data register, we're going to write enable this memory data register and then whatever is on these data lines, which is representative of what was stored here in this, uh, this place in memory is now stored here, right? And this is where we will then go to retrieve the data from memory uh, to use it in our CPU, possibly in um, an ALU for addition, possibly in another general purpose register, uh, something like that. This is just another way to visualize the same thing. You can think about it as like, you know, a, a person looking at the data stored in that particular place when you put that address in the memory address register. Um, and what he sees is is the memory data register, right? He, he now has an impression of, of that thing and it's in his head. Right, so that's that's kind of what this visualization is. It's just a, a different way to approach the same thing. Memory has to be able to read and write. So surrounding those memory cells here, so like you can imagine here, basically what we're looking at is take any one of these cells here and we're now surrounding it basically with two switches. So this is what enables us to either do a read or a write to that memory cell. 
And the way this works is that if I'm doing a read, which is what we've been talking about up until now, um, when the memory address is decoded through the multiplexer and then each one of those lines is turned on, um, this data bus line then basically whatever's in that memory cell is on the data bus line, which means that our memory data register will now have that information. But if we turn the switches, which we said, you know, we saw with the with the write enables, right, on the registers, if we tune these switches, we could do the opposite. We could store something in memory. We could take whatever's in the memory data register and put it into memory by enabling this one to write and reading what's on the data bus from the memory data register. So basically it works like this. Let me go, let me back up a place. If you want to read, you put into the memory address register the memory address you want to read from, and then you let memory actually access that place in, in memory and store it in the memory data register. Then the CPU would come back and look in the memory data register. Once that has completed, which by the way, could take a, a few cycles or more and retrieve the information. However, if I want to store something in memory at this location, I would do the same thing at first. I would put into the memory address register the address where I want to store. So in this example, it's the same, 49. But before I activate memory, I would then put into the memory data register the information I want to store. Let's say I want to store a 4 there, so I'd have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then I would activate memory, but I'd have the switches set so that this is a write. So this works the same. The address decoder takes the address. It figures out that I want this line. But then because the, the write switches are enabled, instead of writing the information to the memory data register, it takes the memory out from the memory data register and stores it into memory. Now, when I say out from, it doesn't necessarily delete it from the memory data register. It just reads from the memory data register and stores in memory at the location in the memory address register. So that's basically how this works. We have these switches. They allow us to um, do both reads and writes to memory. Now, um, a couple of other things that we should talk about with memory. Um, that memory address register size um, in conjunction with, by the way, our operand sizes, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, actually determine um, how big our memory can be, which makes sense, right? We were just talking about that when we said, you know, with the 6502 that um, I didn't want to just have an 8-bit memory address line, even though the rest of the computer was 8 bits and everything else uh, worked on an 8-bit system. Um, in that case, I wanted to say, well, you know, 256 things just isn't enough to store, right? Imagine, you know, we worked with Little Man, right? And, and hypothetically, Little Man had 100 mailboxes, right? And we did literally like really small programs. But imagine how quickly, just based on what you did, you would fill up those 100 mailboxes, especially if you need to save some data. It would take you no time at all. Um, 256 isn't going to be all that much different, right? So in order to actually do something useful with our computer, we needed a memory address size larger. So we actually had a 16-bit memory location there, or memory address register there, which allowed us to have uh, 64,000 things in memory that we could save. Now, it's important to note that if you increase the size of the memory uh, address register, you also have to increase the size of the program counter, right? Because remember, the program counter is what's feeding, at least most of the time, that memory address register. So every program instruction, remember, you in the fetch, you look to the, the program counter, you take whatever value is in there, you put it in the memory address register, um, you then let memory access, you go to the memory data register, you pull that value out, and that's what goes into your instruction register so that you can decode it. Right. Um, so there's a few components in play. If you have a 16-bit memory address register, you also must have a 16-bit program counter because that's what's feeding the memory address register. It also means that you have to have operands in your program that are 16 bits in that case in length, possibly, if you're directly changing, right? Um, 
where where you're going to uh, go with your program counter or you want to reference memory addresses, um, you have to store that somehow. And if you only have 8 bits to store it, that's a little tricky and we're not going to dive too deep into that here. Um, but you need something, uh, a way to, to deal with that because you have, um, you have a, basically have a memory address that's 16 bits in length and you only have 8-bit locations in which to store it. So uh, we're not going to jump off this cliff today, um, but basically you can store it in what what's basically two memory addresses and you store it in what's either called uh, Big Indian or Little Indian format. And the you might have heard those terms somewhere, it's possible. Um, and what they are is basically the order in which you store it. So let's say you have a 16-bit address that um, the first eight bits are just all zeros and the second eight bits are mostly zeros. Let's say it's just memory address four, right? So you have, uh, if I can count this off, uh, zero, 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 there's the first byte, uh, zero, 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 uh, zero, one, zero, zero, right? That's memory address four. If you take that into two single bytes, which remember a byte is eight bits, um, you have to store both halves of that address in memory somewhere. You can either store it with the low order byte first or the high order byte first. Um, and whether or not it is big or little Indian is how you base that decision. There's all kinds of reasons to, to store it one way or the other. Um, we're not going to worry about that right now. But just be aware if you have a larger uh, memory address range than you do a data range, you have to be able to take that uh, memory address and break it up into the size of the data range. Now this has uh, become a little bit less hectic uh, with modern computers as we got into like 64-bit uh, word sizes because 64 bits is, is actually really large and we can see that here, right? So if you look at, you know, 8 bits, we said, whoops, that was only 256 locations, 32 bits, which was really common uh, up until about 10 years ago, uh, allowed you to store up to 4 gigabytes, um, which that was true basically of, of most old computers. In fact, if you had an old Windows machine when you were younger, um, you might be saying, well, wait, but mine maxed out at 3 gigabytes. Well, that was actually a Windows limitation. Um, the enterprise-grade Windows or the server ones would allow you to go to 4, but the desktop ones, for whatever reason, only allowed you to address uh, 3 gigabytes even if you had 4. But technically, a 4 gigabyte, um, or a 6, I'm sorry, 32-bit machine can address up to 4 gigabytes. Um, our modern machines that allow us to address up to 64 bits this way um, this store is actually at 16 exabytes, so it's 16 billion gigabytes, which is, um, in our current frame of reference, I mean, ask us in 10 years, um, in our current frame of reference, um, this is an exorbitantly large number. Now, it's interesting to note that not all 64-bit uh, machines can store 16 exabytes. In fact, I don't know of any that can. Um, now, why is that? Well, it's a really, really large number. It's not one that um, you know we're actually using for, for really much of anything. Maybe the l world's largest supercomputer um, possibly could use it, I don't know. Um, but for what we are using as mere mortals, it's, it's not something that we ever need. So for each of those bits, we have to have bus lines that, that make them work and make them happen. We have to have that multiplexer unit, um, this address decoder here. Remember that every single combination of bits had to have a physical line. So if you had 64 bits coming into this and you actually created physical lines for each of those, you would have 16 billion billion lines. That's insane. Can you imagine that? Um, not likely, right? So uh, that's a lot of actual physical hardware that you'd have to create lines for. And that's that's just not going to happen. So what happens instead is that you'll see that when you go to buy a computer, it will have a maximum amount of memory. And what that's actually representing is really how many physical lines that it supports. So it won't support all 64 combinations, um, but it will probably support, say, 
33, 34 bits, 35 bits, maybe 36 bits of combinations um, to get you to numbers like, you know, you max out at 16 gigs or 32 gigs or 64 gigs or, you know, maybe if it's a Mac Pro or something even higher than that. Um, but that's basically how that works. Um, your instructions also, remember your operand sizes have to support it as well. So, you know, remember when you um, had an operand in Little Man Computer that referenced, uh, say, like a branch location or something like that, So, or, or a memory address. So if your memory address sizing gets that big, your operand also has to be the same size to support you referencing uh, places in memory. So that's also an important part. We're going to talk more about operands and, and the sizing and that kind of stuff later. Uh, we also already talked through this, so this is kind of a recap slide. Remember that DRAM is uh, what we talked about where we had the capacitor and the transistor to, to kind of um, determine whether or not that capacitor should be storing. Uh, something in that the capacitors were constantly refreshed. This happens thousands of times a second. Uh, DRAM or dynamic RAM is what we use in actual RAM memory, right? SRAM was that faster um, transistor-based etched in silicon uh, gated latch that we talked about um, that is used in registers and also in cache, which we're going to talk about uh, more in the future. Other things we should know about memory is that it comes in volatile and non-volatile forms. Uh, I believe we talked about this earlier in the semester. So remember, ROM or read-only memory is basically memory that is um, not usually um, changeable. And I say not usually because there's things like flash memory now that we kind of think of more... Um, in the modern era, it's kind of replaced a lot of the reasons why ROM existed, but there's still uh, good reasons to have some ROM. For example, um, you know, some boot processes within the machine that aren't configurable can be etched into ROM and they never need to be changed. So ROM is read-only. You're never going to change it. Once it's it's in there, it's in there for life, um, unless you actually remove the chip and reflash it. Um, flash memory is an alternative to ROM that can be um, rewritten, but it is non-volatile. Um, so just like ROM, flash memory won't lose whatever you write there when you remove power. But RAM or um, even your registers or um, cache or anything like that, that's all volatile memory. So that is not either ROM or flash memory. Uh, that will be lost the moment you pull power from the computer, which is why, you know, if you're working on something and, and you don't have a laptop with a battery or something and the power cord gets pulled, you know, it, it would all be gone if, you know, it wasn't saved in cloud storage or something like that. Flash memory is basically an idea that, that came about as a way to kind of like keep something stored uh, permanently or semi-permanently in the last few years, but it's for all intents and purposes permanent um, in a uh, kind of transistor by, by wrapping it in insulation. Um, it essentially gave us a way to have something non-volatile like RAM, or I'm sorry, like ROM, that uh, we could actually change. So this started for like your, your basic BIOS systems, which, you know, is your BIOS is when you first start up the computer. It's that, that first bit of uh, system information that's run to, to know where your hard disk is, um, you know, how to find it and where to start it, uh, what type of computer it is, just the basics it needs to just get going and start booting the operating system. Uh, if you want to, say, change the hard disk, you need to configure that in the BIOS. And, and that was done with flash memory. So that's where you would actually retain um, what information uh, you needed to about, like, you know, the hardware on the computer. Um, in addition to that, though, in more recent times, we've been using flash memory to replace the old spinning hard disks. So flash memory is now being used in SSD um, to actually uh, develop these solid state disks that we have now. Those are also composed of flash memory. Uh, so are your USB uh, sticks and, and SD cards and things like that. Uh, all these things are non-volatile, meaning that I can take power away and they still retain the information, versus volatile, uh, which is anything here. Um, you know, that is like your RAM is volatile, your registers are volatile, cache is volatile, all that good stuff. All right.
that's all for uh, this part uh, for today. If you have any questions, uh, please use the forums. The forums are intended to uh, drum up the same kind of discussions that we would have in class, and they give us an opportunity to um, you know, ask them in a, in a format that others might benefit from. So please ask questions there first. I, I would really appreciate it if you do.